Great. Well, thank you. I can only assume that uh, the room filled in because everybody wanted to hear about more obscure environmental credits. Um, at the close of the last, uh, at the last main uh, session, a remark was made of, uh, look, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. I'll probably make a statement even worse. I'm an attorney and I'm here to help you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, we talked a lot about at this conference, uh, opportunities through offsets. There's been some reference to RECs. We just heard about solar. I'm going to talk about another possible opportunity uh, through two different programs, one federal and one state. This is the uh, Federal Renewable Fuel Standard and the Generation of RINs and uh, the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard and the Generation of LCFS Credits. Uh, these, are, these are programs that have generally been overlooked by the biogas industry as a whole, uh, and this includes not just digesters, but also landfills and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, but I'd say about three years ago, we really started to, uh, to get some interest in it. So, um, and it's been, been steadily growing um, over the last, uh, particularly over the last year, year and a half. Uh, this is just a statement that my firm requires me to put in. Don't believe anything I have to say about what's gonna happen in the future. And anything I do say is based on uh, publicly available information and not uh, any client uh, confidential information. So a uh, little background on my law firm, who we are, what we do. I'm with the firm Sutherland, Asbel & Brennan, we have offices uh, throughout the country and in London and Geneva as well. My private, we're a full service corporate law firm. Uh, my I'm in the energy group and particularly the energy commodity group. We have a real specialty advising on the trade of, of energy commodities. Uh, we're, for the most part, a federal practice uh, in the sense that we deal with federal agencies. Uh, and we deal with pretty much every agency that touches the movement of energy commodities. That's gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, as well as natural gas, um, uh, electricity, and more recently, particularly over the past seven, eight years, renewable fuel, renewable transportation fuel, which the most recent form being uh, using biogas as a transportation fuel. And, and in that process, we touch pretty much every agency and really try to uh, be a full service to our clients, uh, with the exception of all, no, we, we don't lobby. Uh, Within the renewable fuel space, we are, uh, I think, extremely of an extreme depth of, an ex of experience here. Renewable fuel, when I talk about that, that is uh, probably what most of you, if you're familiar with it, have in mind, and you're right, it's ethanol, ethanol and biodiesel. Uh, the, this is uh, stem from various mandates, but most, uh, in particular, the renewable fuel standard over the last several years. Uh, and we have been really at the forefront of, of helping clients in that, that implementation um, and all the way from generating credits to trading them to advising the companies that, that actually have to use these credits uh, for compliance. Our perspective uh, is, we like to say, is from the trenches, uh, which meaning from really to drive home the point that I'm not a lobbyist, though I spent seven years in D.C. in our, in our D.C. office and just recently uh, moved up to New York. Uh, we're not we're not lobbyists. We're not, and we though we do represent a number of oil companies. Uh, we represent them on their day to day compliance issues uh, and enforcement and contractual issues. Uh, they certainly have various political positions, but that is uh, that's not us. And the experience that I can share is one just from day to day work. So. Um, I'm going to, usually this presentation on the renewable fuel standard definitely usually lasts an hour, typically sometimes for clients that are heavily involved, four hours. So if you're going to take anything away, take these points away from the presentation. I want to hit the uh, third point, though. Uh, it's probably a little overstated. Uh, that statement about capital investment really depends on your location. Uh, the demand within your surrounding community and your overall size. Uh, but it can be a, a situation where there is not, um, compared to other types of uh, renewable fuel, sourcing that as a transportation fuel, comparatively, it can be uh, relatively minor investment. The other aspect I want to hit 
is to take advantage of any of these credits that I'm going to cover today. The fuel, the biogas, needs to be used as a transportation fuel that's fundamentally different than uh, what's traditionally been used in a uh, gas cap captured from digesters. So why we're even talking about this today is really nothing to do with the credits that I'm going to talk about. Uh, what has driven the market for uh, gas as a transportation fuel is our fundamentally low price of natural gas today. We are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Uh, we have a lower uh, price point for natural gas than any other country in the world, uh, in the developed world. Uh, and you know, comparatively to Europe, it, it just works. So that's chink, and then there's typically gas and oil traded together, roughly on the same energy content basis, about seven, eight years ago, primarily because we are awash in natural gas, uh, and natural gas started to become used for different purposes than crude oil. Crude oil isn't burned in this country anymore to produce power. Uh, became decoupled from the price, uh, and oil went up and natural gas went down. Uh, as a result, on an energy content basis up until maybe yesterday or the day before, as, as oil keeps tracking downwards despite what uh, a number of analysts have predicted, um, you know, if we had this conversation two months ago, I would have cited to uh, you know, some investment banks that were pred predicting we'd be back up at 60 or $70 oil uh, right now. Um, the, but there's this differential between natural gas prices, so it's generally uh, cheaper, uh, has been over the last uh, decade, to power your car on natural gas than it has been on gasoline. And in fact, I, I fly down to Houston quite a bit, and as you leave the airport, there's a sign that would say, like, $1.50, $2 gasoline, and it always catches your eye, but that's not actually gasoline, it's their advertisement for natural gas. Um, so, the credits that I'm going to talk about are additive of, um, of this benefit for uh, low natural gas prices uh, because it's relatively easy. Once you get digester gas uh, scrubbed or landfill gas scrubbed and get it into the system uh, through a pipeline or trucking uh, or just on site, uh, it's, it's a the additional credits are just a, a huge add-on for uh, the already low price. So let's talk about the renewable fuel standard. What is the, the RFS is a program that was initially passed in 2004 and then it was complete, completely revamped in 2007. Uh, this is kind of creates an unholy marriage of environmentalists, corn, uh, corn industry and domestic jobs, uh, energy security folks. Uh, and it created this, this sort of monster that uh, is now a uh, now just a, a significant uh, regulatory program. If any of you are familiar with Dodd Frank, uh, I know you're not my typical audience of, of banks and the like, but undoubtedly you've heard about it in the news. Um, and you know, this was the financial reform passed in the wake of uh, the housing crisis. There are more pages of federal government. Um, a guidance and rules for the renewable fuel standard than there are for Dodd Frank. Um, what what it does is it requires all those refiners and importers of gasoline and diesel to ensure that certain amounts of renewable fuel is used each year in the transportation uh, pool fuel. Uh, they do this through renewable fuel producers, ethanol, biodiesel folks, producing credits known as RINs, renewable identification numbers. Uh, those. Those credits are associated with the fuel they produce, uh, and then they can be separated and then traded. Ultimately, the refiners, the importers of gasoline and diesel, have to buy these rents for compliance, uh, and that's how the program works. The um, these the somewhat unsightly circles of what the mandates are. Uh, if you've heard of the RFS, if you have heard uh, of the renewable fuel mandates, you probably heard about it in the context of the ethanol mandate corn ethanol mandate, and that for good reason, because all this green stuff is the corn ethanol mandate. With it, you may have even heard, if you've heard a little bit more about it, of biodiesel, corn ethanol, corn and ethanol and biodiesel mandates. And that's because the yellow circle is the biodiesel mandate. The blue and the tiny red dot are what uh, is the, 
what's left over for the other types of fuels, which is pretty much satisfied through two sources, biogas and renewable diesel. And there's only so much renewable diesel in the world. Renewable diesel is a refined product produced by um, Finnish oil company Neste, uh, but they can only produce so much. The rest and the entire red dot there is biogas. Uh, and this is for 2015. I won't get into why we're dealing with proposed standards for 2015, despite the fact of being July. Um, but, and that may seem tiny, but put some numbers around it. That's 100 million gallons of equivalency of gasoline. The credit value of that right now is $70 million, and that's annual. So that's $70 million that's going to go to the biogas industry annually. The remaining blue part can largely be filled with biogas as well, and that's another about $200 million. And that's an, an if you had an annual grant, the USDA came out and said, we're going to give you $200 million, $250 million for biogas each year, everybody would be thrilled. Uh, that's what the EPA has done, uh, and that those numbers are gonna increase each year um, as we go forward. You can see that, uh, if you can read those from back there. The basic point is that we have a proposal for 2016. The numbers double for, when we're talking about biogas, we're talking about cellulosic biofuel. Uh, and so those numbers double from 100 million to 200 million. Uh, therefore doubling the, the revenue potential. So how do you, how do you capture this? Uh, there are, as I alluded to, there are a number of uh, regulatory requirements. Compliance is extremely uh, rigorous, uh, and there are a number of boxes you have to check that every party has to, has to check, but they focus on registration, record keeping, reporting, and ensuring. RIN validity, there has been a lot of fraud in this marketplace of people just saying, I've got a biodiesel plant. They actually don't have a biodiesel plant. And they've produced hundreds of millions of dollars of these credits and sold them out in the marketplace. Uh, and those people are now, four of them are sitting in jail for the next 20 years of their life. Uh, it, was, it was major, major fraud that occurred in the marketplace. Biogas is actually People, the oil companies have to buy these credits. They were they were punished for the fraud that took place uh, on the part of these these individuals because their credits were invalidated that they had used for compliance. They had to go out and buy more credits, and they had enforcement actions brought against them for using invalid credits. So, um, validity is extremely important, and biogas, uh, because for the most part. Uh, we've seen in the, in the landfill context, injection into pipelines, there's inherently a third party verification as to oh, gas is flowing. There's only so many local distribution companies. There are only so many uh, large interstate pipelines and they can readily verify that. Uh, just in terms of additional uh, points here, uh, again, the fuel type must be a transportation fuel. Um, there are different types of credits and I won't go into that and the types of RINs that can be generated, but the point is, if, if you go down this path, you can see, two, you'll hear the difference between cellulosic and advanced biofuel RINs. The industry sometimes makes a big point of that, the biogas industry. Uh, in my opinion, what I've seen is that there's very little differential in the price is, in, currently there's no real difference in price, it's very minor uh, of those credits, um, and I don't see that changing in the future. Uh, RIN quantity, you generate one RIN for every 77,000 BTUs uh, of gas, put another way. Uh, for every MMBTU of gas you produce, you produce about nine RINs. Uh, and electricity, you generate one uh, RIN for every 22.6 kilowatt hours. Uh, some key considerations for generating RINs, everybody needs to hold hands in this transaction. And if you have a situation where you have a farm and you have a digester and you're powering some equipment on your, your farm, uh, some transportation equipment or people in the local area and people are coming to your digester. That's very simple. There's one or two parties involved in that. But if you're fortunate enough to be located near an interstate pipeline, you have a very large uh, farm or you're able to pool waste from various farms or other food processing sources, uh, and, and really get enough gas together that you can inject into a pipeline, um, you then have subsequently a number of parties uh, involved. You have the marketer, you have the, the biogas, the, the owner of the farm, you have the 
uh, operator of the digester, maybe a third party of the marketer, you have the compressor, the liquefier of the gas, and then you have the folks using this. And I can say this may sound all very pie in the sky, but uh, BP and Shell over the last two years have gone out and pretty much entered into contracts with all the major uh, land, large landfills, high BTU landfill projects out there because they need these RINs for compliance. And so they were able to get those locked into long-term contracts. Those are now used up and those same companies as we looked at those standards going up and up each year will have to, the folks that weren't as active as BP and Shell uh, will have to find sources for those RINs. Uh, and, um, we see them starting to show interest in, in digesters, uh, in particular, you know, amalgamating waste digesters. Um, the, again, if you're, whether you're producing gas or electricity, it needs to be used as transportation fuel. Another important point is that if you're fortunate to get into a pipeline uh, or an electric grid, you can then, you don't have to have the transportation use near you. It can be out in California uh, if you want, uh, and there's a need for it because particularly on the, the electricity side, a big stumbling block has been demand. There's not that many electric vehicles out there. We're starting to see some interest. Um, Tesla is exploring uh, generating winds uh, because they have these supercharging stations, very easy for them to quantify. GE power um, charging st supercharging stations are doing that as well. <clears throat> but the point is, you don't need to have it right at your particular locality. These numbers mean very little, but the point here is that um, biogas ring generation really started in earnest uh, middle of last year, and it's been relatively consistent since then. That's um, not what was predicted. We expected uh, dramatic increases, and the reason we haven't seen that is because EPA is holding up registrations. EPA takes an exceedingly long time to process registrations, not just for biogas, but somebody wants to import uh, renewable fuel into the Gulf Coast, they have to register. That can take six months to a year. So there's a big wave of registrations that are pending. And you'll see RINs go uh, up as soon as those get processed. Key point, the RIN market is incre incredibly volatile. And just to throw some numbers around, the RIN market is an eight to $13 billion a year annual market. It is a massive, massive compliance market dwarfs almost any other environmental commodity market out there and dwarfs many uh, underlying commodity markets as well. It is um, also incredibly volatile, and that's because uh, regulatory it's a creature of regulatory construction. This isn't a voluntary program. It's a mandatory program. So uh, the prices just fluctuate wildly. It's not for the faint of heart uh, in terms of there are traders out there that trade these RINs, uh, but the parties that need to comply uh, tend to want to, if they're, they might have a RIN trading book, but they more than likely are just accruing RINs as fast as they can at hopefully low prices. So for a, a smaller player in the market, a very small player in the market, the best move to do, enter into a long-term contract where you get a set price for your RIN because you're not gonna wanna pay attention to what uh, is going on in the RIN market. And you can do that, you can lock in a price, you get a price float. Um, but the key point is the, the actual revenue that can be generated and is generated on these RINs. We see, um, regardless of the type of digester, uh, you have a current, a current RIN price is about seven and a half dollars per MMBTU. Um, or upwards of eight, but that has fluctuated as high as $13 per MMBTU over the last uh, couple of years. Touch briefly on the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, this is a program that's similar in nature in, the, in terms of its goals. It wants to incentivize uh, uh, low carbon fuels into the transportation pool. Uh, one point on the RFS that I didn't make, it is the one and only statute that Congress has passed that requires greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, it may do so in a very, uh, not very efficient way in terms of it creates mandates uh, for certain types of fuels, but those fuels have to achieve certain greenhouse gas reductions. Only law that Congress has passed and the president has signed on that point. Um, the, um, the, the LCFS does this in a much more efficient way. They say, we're not gonna pick winners and losers, just 
we set a target for greenhouse gas um, carbon intensity reductions. And however that um, happens as from the transportation pool, that's fine by us, provided they meet all the, the registration and reporting requirements. Um, but if you bring in a fuel that's above the standard, gasoline and diesel, you incur a deficit where you have to go out and buy a credit for someone that brings in a lower carbon intensity fuel. The relevant part is biogas is incredibly low carbon intense. And when you have uh, these standards get dramatically lower in 2020, I've been to a number of conferences. Uh, I can't speak to this in terms of firsthand knowledge, but I've heard a number of times the only way these standards are met is switching to natural gas vehicles in California, renewable electricity vehicles, and sourcing that through biogas uh, combustion or a CNG or LNG to meet these standards. They're just too aggressive. We've seen a little bit of a lag time in that because another compliance mechanism that the, the obligated parties that have to comply with this have done is they've been acquiring credits uh, over the past five years whenever they've been generated because the credits don't expire. Oops. Um, again, compliance obligations, I don't want to focus on these, but it's fairly robust, but it is simpler than uh, the RFS. Um, you need to have a pathway, meaning the pipeline, if you get to a pipeline, it needs to be connected to California, but you can be outside of California and still generate these credits. Um, you can also pass the obligation, the regulatory constraints downstream or to another party, and that's a point under the RFS too. You probably, if you operate a digester, you probably don't want to get involved in this massive um, uh, compliance scheme. So enter into a contract with somebody who already does that, um, who has to comply as a result of their other activities, um, and get a percentage of, of the value of the RINs, and usually that's somewhat substantial. Um, just a comparison between the RFS and LCFS, uh, in short, the LCFS is uh, much easier. It's much more straightforward. Um, point on the, the credit markets uh, is that uh, it's also volatile. It's not as active as the RIN markets. But current values are about $4.5 per MMBTU. The important part there is that's additive of the RIN value. So if you're generating LCFS credits, you're also going to be generating RINs. And so that Right now, at current price is about $12 per MMBTU, um, with natural gas prices at $2.5 to $3 per MMBTU in the United States, depending on the time of year and the location. Um, you know, you're, you have about $15 there to work with. Um, that's separate and apart from any grants you might receive to build the digester uh, or any other incentives that are out there. There are also um, I'll skip just ahead. There are also uh, other programs that are either in place or in the works. We've heard a number of people talk about offsets today. Um, we haven't looked at at our firm the ability to generate uh, offsets and RINs and, rec or RINs and LCFS credits at the same time. But from theoretically, um, it should be, it seems like something that should be workable. RECs are a different issue if you're also looking to generate those. Um, but as a matter of law, it's not prohibited. There's just technical issues in there. That's a state-by-state -state determination. But Oregon is rolling out its own program uh, that's going to start for compliance purposes at the beginning of next year. Washington was due to up until three days ago when the governor's um, hand was forced uh, on a transportation issue to scrap their uh, clean fuels program, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, just go back to um, generating credits on, on biogas, LCFS credits. Very similar uh, documentation is key. Gas must be used as a transportation fuel. And uh, gas is fungible. But you don't need to hold hands with all the parties involved in the chain. You just need to hold hands with the party that generated the, uh, the gas, put it, got it onto a pipeline or some other or electric grid, um, and then the party in California that's using it as a transportation fuel. So with that, um, that, uh, that concludes the, the presentation. I don't have any great uh, definitive ending to it, but other than my uh, esteemed bio. Well, thank you for <laughs> sitting through uh, the presentation. I appreciate it.